finish celebrating St. Valentine's Day and the chocolates are all eaten up. And if you like my family, we've got a couple of chocolate strawberries still left in the fridge. The roses are beginning to wither. Somebody say it's complicated. Psalm 139, verse 16, we're going to start there. There's a, a few places God is instructing me to go. It's complicated. Father, we honor you for this time together. Grant us truth so that we can be made free. In Jesus' name, amen. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. Psalm 139, verse 16. Are you there? Bible says this, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, you see that, God, your eyes saw my substance and my imperfections, right? My limitations, my struggles, right? When God made me, he made all of me. He made me with the capacity to read and articulate, and he made me with the incapacity to dance. <laughs> You'll get that on the way home. He made me with all of my goodness and all of my badness. He made me with all of my fortune and all of my pain. He made me all of me. It said, right? It says, David said this now. This is in the Bible. You saw my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book are all my members written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there were none of them. Somebody say it's complicated. Y'all, I brought a couple of books. Because, you know, I'm an English teacher and I have an affinity for books. I don't read as much as I should, but I still love books and I love words. And I brought two books. Some of you might have heard of this book. Anybody ever seen or heard of this book? It's called The Giving Tree by Shell Service. And I see a couple of children um, with their hands up. Has anybody ever heard of this book? Poetics and Rhetoric by Aristotle. Anybody? Okay, so you have two books here. Now, now, God said, you wrote all my members in your book, right? I have these two books here, The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein and Poetics and Rhetoric by Aristotle. Both of these books are in my house. And when I'm feeling nostalgic and I feel like I want to go back in time, I'll go to the Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And The Giving Tree is a children's picture book that was written by Shel Silverstein, published in 1964, and it has become one of Silverstein's best-known titles. And has been translated into numerous languages. And this is a children's book. It has 621 words in 30 pages, averages 21 words a page. And I'm going to read an excerpt from... The Giving Tree. Story time at Evangelistic Ministries Church. Once there was a tree. And she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come. And he would gather her leaves. And the tree was happy. Clap it up for Shel Silverstein's Giving Tree. Come on, clap it up for... Shell Silverstein's Giving Tree. And so when I want to go back in time to my younger days, and, or I want to read a, a good children's book to my children, I go to The Giving Tree. Now, I also own this book, Poetics and Rhetoric by Aristotle. Y'all, I just got my master's degree a couple of years ago, and when I tell you going to graduate school is a lot different than undergrad, a lot different than high school, a whole lot different than middle school, and way different than elementary school. And so I'm going to read to you an excerpt from Poetics 
and Rhetoric by Aristotle. The enthymeme in the example must then deal with what is in the main contingent, the example being an induction in the enthymeme a syllogism about such matters. The enthymeme must consist of few propositions, fewer often than those which make up the normal syllogism. For if any of these propositions is a, a familiar fact, there is no need even to mention it. The hearer adds it himself. Thus, to show that Dorius is, has um, been victor in a contest for which the prize is a crown. Give it up for Poetics and, and Rhetoric by Aristotle. Come on, clap your hands for Poetics and Rhetoric by Aristotle. Did y'all understand anything? You know why? Because it's complicated. It's complicated. Both of these books are in my house. And both of these books have served me a purpose in its season. This book provided me entertainment and inspiration. This book provided me an opportunity to further my education. And even though this book may not be as complicated as this book, both of these books are in the same house. And I will venture to say in your house, there are many books. You got a husband book. Giving tree. You got a wife book, Poetics and Rhetoric by Aristotle. And y'all, I found out something. This might be news to you, but y'all, there are only two genders on the planet. I don't care what popular culture and folks try to say or do in this gender fluid society. Bible says, and God created he male and female created he them. That's it. That's it. That's it. I mean, no, no, if, ands, or buts about it, you can take it to the bank. Male and female created he, them. And I thank God for my female. But as much as I thank God for my fine female, at times, It's complicated. It's complicated. 55,525 words. 300 words a page. But the Holy Spirit told me that as complicated as things may be, I'm going to give you a formula on how to simplify your significant relationships. Because part of the problem why things get so complicated when it comes to relationships is because we all, every time we mention the word relationship, we only think about one type of relationship. The male and the female, an intimate relationship of, of a man and a woman meeting one another and falling in love and getting married and having children, etc. Et but how many of you know there are more relationships than just the male and the female dynamic? And so when we talk about when we talk about simplifying significant relationships and things being complicated, when we think about the word complicated, we think of only one definition. But how many of you know the word complicated has two definitions? So when you think of the word complicated, what are some synonyms or words that you think about when you think of the word complicated? What do you think? Difficult, hard, right? Complex, right? Challenging, right? And so that is one definition. But if you know anything about dictionaries, y'all, when a word is in the dictionary and a word has more than one meaning, the first meaning that is described for that word is the way that word is used the most. So complicated does have two definitions, but the one you described is the second definition. Right? Difficult to analyze, explain, or understand. That's the second definition of the word complicated. But I want you to write down this definition. Complicated. Composed of elaborately interconnected parts. Complicated. Composed 
of elaborately interconnected parts. You got that? Composed of elaborately interconnected parts. That's what complicated means. So complicated is, is not about just something being difficult. It's about whether or not the interconnected parts are composing and working together. Because something can be complicated and still work in concert. Listen, listen, it's complicated. Might have went. Shh. Something can be complicated and still work in concert. Something can be complicated and still be a complement instead of a contradiction. Because, see, here's the problem. Because there are so many interconnected parts and because you have some things that are uh, uh, not yet fully formed and I have some things that are not yet fully formed and you have some flaws and I have some flaws, we see our flaws as failures. But God sees your flaws and mine as an opportunity to complement one another. Are you with me? You still with me? I'm going to show it to you right here in Genesis chapter 1. Look what the Bible says. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was what? Light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Y'all, it was good because it was so. Watch this. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament of the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and it was so, because it was good, and it was good, because it was so. And God had all these interconnected parts. Complicated but in concert. Complicated, but complementing one another. You with me? Skip down to verse number 22. I'm sorry, skip down to verse number 27. Bible says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Two separate genders. Male, somebody say male. And female. Somebody say female. Now, y'all, there's only two genders on the planet. Male and female. Man and woman. Boy and girl. You with me? But can I submit to you this morning that some of the difficulties that you have in your intimate relationships whether you have a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, or a wife, or you're interested in somebody, the reason why there's such difficulty in this and the reason why things are complicated, it may be because of what happened when you was a boy with your father or the lack thereof. Or could it be the, the, the relationship that you had when you were a girl with your mother or a girl with your father or, or a boy with your mother? Listen, I want you to write this down. What happens at home does not just stay at home. You can tell your children all day what happens in this house stays in this house. But I want to let you know this morning that it's going to manifest itself one way or the other. Good, bad, or indifferent. What's done in the dark is going to come to light. What happens behind closed doors is going to come to the forefront. Because it's complicated. It's not difficult to explain, analyze. It's not difficult to control. It's just a bunch of different interconnecting parts that are elaborately connected together. Watch this now. In verse 28, look what it says. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful. Somebody say fruitful. Multiply. Say multiply. Replenish the earth. Say replenish the earth. Subdue it. Say subdue it. 
and have dominion. Say have dominion. So here we go. Here, here's our five purposes. The first point I want you to make is you got to know your role. If you're going to simplify significant relationships, you've got to know your role. And here's your role. God said, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue, and take dominion. If you're doing anything outside of those five facets of your function and your form, God says it's going to be complicated for your life. Let's go over them again. It's right here delineated in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, or verse 28, it says, when God blessed them or when he empowered them, when he breathed into them, the Bible says that he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and take dominion. Over what? Fish, fowl, and living things that move upon the earth. Ooh, I'm finna mess with you. I'm about to mess with you. He did not say have dominion over each other. You must not know who I am. I know who you are. You're my husband, the house, that the, the, the part of the house that bands it together. You are, you are the one that's supposed to be the one that keeps everything in line. You're supposed to be the glue, not the domineering, agitated, angry, fussing, fighting, cussing all the time, always anxious, always anxiety, and having all, like you a wound up ticking time bomb. You're supposed to be my husband. You're supposed to take dominion over fish, fowl, creeping things, not me. I'm the man. Anytime a man got to stand up and say, I'm the man, he's not. You see me, you see the beard, you hear the voice, you see I'm a man. I ain't got to say that to nobody. You can look at me and tell that I'm a man. But don't just look at me. Watch how I walk in dominion. Watch how I walk in authority. Watch how I articulate to my children. Watch how I honor my wife. You can see that I'm the man. And that didn't just happen, y'all. That didn't just happen. Because I was raised with lack. I was raised. I was raised, y'all, unformed. God knew when he breathed into me that my dad wasn't going to be in my life. But he said, I'm going to supplement with this Holy Spirit. I'm going to put a covenant father in your life. I'm going to put a bishop in your life and a first lady. I'm going to show you some examples so that you can be something for your son. Is there anybody in this room this morning? Why I say it's complicated. It's, it's complicated, right? Yeah. But it's not complicated because it's hard, no. It's complicated because there's a lot of elaborately interconnected pieces that need to learn how to work in concert with one another. And so that's what God said, right? God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, take dominion. You still with me? Go to Chapter 2, verse 7. Here we go. Here we go. Chapter 2, verse 7. Are you there? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a nephesh, a living soul, a, a speaking spirit. Okay? So the ruach, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit was breathed into man's nostrils, and he was made alive. He was made alive to walk in the authority of his God, of his maker. He was made alive to speak as God spoke, to rule as God ruled, because God is not going to require anything of you without first empowering you to do so. He's going to empower you to do so. And so if God has anointed you to be a husband, you're going to have that anointing rest upon you. Now, whether or not you tap into that and know your role and your function and your form in that role, that's between you and God. But please know that if it's God ordained, he has anointed you for that position. Amen. You still with me? Now, watch this. Look what it says. It says that man became a living soul, a, a speaking spirit. Okay? And it was good because it was so. And God placed man in a garden, didn't he? 
He placed them in a garden. Now, people think that Adam was created in the garden. No, he was created outside the garden and then placed in the garden so that the garden can be an exact mirror reflection of what he came from. This is what God told Jeremiah. Before I formed you in your belly, I ordained you and I knew you and called you to be a prophet to the nations. Before your mama and your daddy met at the club or the, the concert or the, the church, or the bar, the, the street, the <laughs> match.com, come on, social media, however they met. God said, I knew you and I breathed into you. I formed you and anointed you and ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. So I don't care what context you were born. I don't care how complicated that was. If it was an adulterous affair or no, whether they were single or married or no, it doesn't matter. God says, I've got your family together. I got your mother and your father together to get you here because I ordained you and I called you to be who I've ordained and called you to be. So he spoke to him, his speaking spirit, right? Placed him in a garden. Now watch this. Look at verse Look at verse 18. I'm still in chapter 2. Look at verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good. Now, up until this point, God was saying that everything that he was doing was good. And it was good because it was so, right? It was happening, right? Things working in concert, and things complementing one another. Things, the elaborately interconnected parts were working in concert together. But here God sees a glitch in the matrix and God says, hold up, it is not good. It is not good, watch this now, that the man should be what? Should be what? Alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And so you would think that the next verse would be God putting Adam to sleep. To make the help meet the finer side of him. But no, look what happens next. After God declared that it was not good for man to be alone and he'll make a help meet for him, it says out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast. And every fowl and brought them unto Adam. Why? Because God told Adam, male and excuse me, male and female, in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 28, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, fill it, and, and take dominion. He said, I want you to start activating your purpose. Because you cannot, you are not ready for a partner if you're not first walking in your purpose. Adam was single. By himself. And God said, not Adam, but God said, I'm going to make a help meet. And the first thing that God did in, before he made Adam a help meet was he placed Adam in purpose. What was his purpose? He, he had to know his role. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 28. So he brought the fish, the fowl, the, the creeping things up to Adam. And because he was a speaking spirit, God brought these to Adam with no life in him. He brought them to him. And who spoke over the dog? Not God. Adam did. Who spoke over the giraffe? Not God. Adam did. Who spoke over the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and the monkey? Not God. Adam did. So don't tell me I came from no ape. I got authority over apes. Ain't no evolution up in here. Charles Darwin, I know you were a smart man, but I'm the one that gave the ape its authority. Purpose. Somebody say purpose. I said, I got to know my role. I, gotta, I, can't, I can't be ready for a partner if I don't first walk in my purpose. Amen? And it says he brought those to him. And the Bible says, and whatsoever Adam called them. Every living creature, look what it says. That was the name thereof. So who named them? Adam did. Now watch this. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl, to every beast, but for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. So now he's in his purpose. He's aligned with his purpose. And God says, now, boy, you ready for a partner. Woo. You ready for a partner now. Now watch what happens. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took out of Adam one of his ribs. Not out of the ground. Out of Adam. Because God said, there is another extension of my glory that's inside of you. 
Yeah, see, 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 it got complicated. It got kind of complicated because he was walking in his purpose, but he did not have a partner. And so God says, I'm going to cause a deep sleep to fall upon you. In other words, I'm going to let you rest. I'm going to let you rest in your authority. I'm going to let you rest in your purpose. And out of your rib, out of your side, out of your heart, I'm going to show you another extension, another facet of who I am. And it's going to come out of you. Oh, glory be to God. Don't tell me that you can't decree and declare a thing and it not be so. Well, I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Why don't you know? It's in you. When God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, he opened up Adam's side and took the rib out of Adam. It did not come from God. It did not come from the ground. It came from the person who was walking in his purpose. Look at this. He's walking in his purpose. Took the rib. Closed up the flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woe man. And brought her unto the man. Watch this. Look what it says. It's parallel here. Just like God brought the animals to the man, lifeless, and Adam named every animal. Look, look at this picture here. God forms the woman out of the rib of man and brings her to Adam, lifeless. Watch this. Watch this. Look what it says in verse number 23. And Adam said, up until this point, who was the only one speaking? And God said, and God said, and God said, and now God had all of these elaborately interconnected parts working in concert together. Then he creates man, gives him his purpose. He knows his role. He's walking in his purpose. And now Adam can say, just like God said, when God breathes his Ruach into you, you can speak just like God spoke. You can speak just like God spoke. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone. Compliment. Flesh of my flesh. Concert. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Who said this? Did God say this? No. Adam said this. This is why we need brothers to start walking in their rightful authority as believers. It's not, oh, here we go. It's not going to take another legislative law. It's not going to take another bill passed by the president. It's going to take some men of God to stand up and be who God has called them to be in order for society to be what God had first envisioned it to be. I don't care how many programs, I don't care how many nonprofits, if a man is not walking in his rightful authority and his rightful position, we're still going to have committing suicide. We're still going to have drugs. We're still going to have teenage pregnancy. We're still going to have dropout rates at an all-time high. We're still going to have a ruckus and crime in our streets. Somebody got to stand up and be who God called them to be. You still with me? Says, Adam said this, right? Why did Adam say this? Because he, he knew his role. He knew his role. He was walking in his purpose. Verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were transparent. They knew each other's passwords. They were Facebook friends together with each other. They didn't have any burner accounts. Oh, come on. They weren't sliding into nobody else's DMs. Come on. They were in concert together. They were naked. They were transparent. They were exposed. And there was no shame because they perfectly complimented one another. And y'all, even in this moment, it was complicated. Because anytime you get more than one part... It's complicated. Anytime you invite another person into your space, it gets complicated. Why? Because it's not about it being difficult. It's about interconnected, elaborately interconnected pieces working in concert together. And so here we are, man and woman. God making a decree. 
For this call shall a man leave his father and mother. See, this is all precedent, right, that, that Adam is setting. Adam didn't have a father. Adam did not have a mother. But he was setting precedent by the spirit of God that was on the inside of him. It was an extension of who God was. He saw before he saw. He saw in the spirit before he saw in the physical. He said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Oh, come on now. And here comes the serpent. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any other creature of the field. That sounds like an antagonist is coming into our book, right? An enemy, a villain, Jafar, Aladdin, Commodus, Gladiator. This, this, this villain, this antagonist, this opposition is starting to complicate things, right? Because he, he doesn't just want the interconnected pieces to be elaborately working together. He wants to cause confusion. He doesn't want compliments. He wants confusion. He doesn't want concert. He wants contradiction. So here comes the contradiction. The serpent, more cunning, more crafty than any other beast of the field. Oh, excuse me. Who gave the serpent that trait? Did God give the serpent that ability? No, because who named every creature on the planet? Adam did. See, you create the snakes in your life with your own voice. Watch your mouth. Point two, come up. Somebody say, come up. Come up, come up. You got to come up. Watch your mouth. Watch what you watch and watch what you say. Because Adam created this calamity in his own family. Adam created this calamity in his own family. Because he's the one that gave the snake its characteristics to begin with. Because last I checked in Genesis chapter 2, Adam named every creature. And a serpent was one of those creatures that he named. Gave him his characteristics, his traits. He said, this is who you'll be. So here comes this serpent with a contradiction. The serpent began to talk. Hold up, wait a minute. Hold up, hold up. Last I checked, when God was creating all of these in, uh, elaborately interconnected pieces, he only gave one piece of the puzzle the authority to ruach, or he only breathed his ruach into one piece, and only one piece became a nephesh, a speaking spirit. That was man, not a snake. Not a snake. What this snake doing talking? As soon as the snake began to speak, Adam should have stood up and took his authority. But he said, he's like, oh, look at this snake talking. What's it? Fascinated by something that is flawed. Fascinated by something that is walking outside of his purpose. You doing channel surfing, you flipping through screens. Look at what's on this TV. Ain't this a shame? Did you fascinated? You stunned by it. Honey, come look at this. Invite all the spirits into your house. Somebody say it's complicated. But we got to come up. Now, knowing our role is our function, right? What we're supposed to do. How we're supposed to behave. But coming up has to do with our facets. You are more than you give yourself credit to be. Stop settling. I'm going to say it again. Stop settling because God's breath is inside of you. And so here's Adam. He's focused on a beast that's speaking. And he allowed the beast to speak so much that it caused them to go outside of the will of God. And so now I want to show you how Adam responds when sin is brought into the picture where they disobeyed God. Look at chapter 3, verse number 11, after Adam and Eve take of the forbidden fruit and they sin, and Eve says, I knew I was naked, look at verse 11, so I hid myself, God said, who told you you were naked? What voice did you allow to speak outside of my authority? Because you were supposed to have dominion. Were fish, fowl, 
creeping things. Yourself. Listen. I'm going to say it again. You missed it because sometimes it's complicated. You were supposed to have dominion over fish, fowl, creeping things. And yourself. Why? Because that tree came from the very ground that you came from. From the dust of the ground, God made and formed. The tree was born from the dust of the ground, or from, the, from the ground it came up. And so God was saying, this ain't about apples and oranges and pears. This is about the authority that you have not only over fish, fowl, and creeping things, but this is about authority that you have over yourself. This is why you get so frustrated and you, and you, and you have these small little petty things that rise up in your relationships and they take you out because you forgot about to, how to rule yourself, how to, how to rule yourself, your yourself. If you focus on yourself and not her, man, and what you need to change about yourself, if you focused on yourself and not him, woman, and what you need to change about yourself. See, 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 sometimes this fruit comes out of our own ground. And look what happens. <laughs> Who told you we're naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you shouldn't eat of? Oh, here we go. Skip down to verse 15. God starts talking. I'm going to put enmity, conflict, complication between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. Between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and you shall bruise his heel. But now I want to I show you something here on how Adam responded when God confronted Adam. Look at verse number 12. And the man said, what did he say? The woman you gave to be with me. I have a problem with what Adam just said there. <laughs> Somebody else said me too. <laughs> the me too movement, Bishop, I love it. Did y'all see it though? Because Adam made a mistake. He said, the woman that you gave me to be with, um, excuse me, who named the woman? Did God name the woman? All, Adam, all God did was form her. Brought her to Adam, lifeless. He created the very thing that now he's blaming God. Watch your mouth. Somebody say, come up. Somebody say, come up. You are blaming God for all this stuff that you created with your own voice. God, the car that you gave me that got repossessed because you couldn't pay the notes, you signed the dotted line. My sugar, that ain't your sugar. My diabetes, I don't own that. I created it with my mouth by speaking it or eating it. Some of us spoke ourselves into existence. Some of us ate our way into the, the circle that we're standing in. What have you been consuming? Because sometimes what you consume begins to control you. Oh, come on now. Then you, start, then you start turning into something that you didn't even, you can't even recognize your own self in the mirror. You can't even recognize. You had so much faith. You had so much passion. You had so much power. But God says, come up. Somebody say, come up. There's a facet. There's, a, there's another face. There's another facet. There's another form. There's another function that I have for you. It ain't just about you doing the current things that you're doing right now. God says, I have anointed you and ordained you to be a prophet to the nations, not a whore who goes from bed to bed. I've ordained you to be a prophet to the nation, not somebody who's always getting into it with folks and always high, strong, and out of control. I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. Somebody say, come up. See, if I want to if I want to simplify my significant relationships, I've got to first know my role. And the second thing I got to do is I got to come up. I got to come up. I need my wife as an illustration real quick. I got to come up. I got to come up. Sweet, if you would stand right here at the foot of the steps, face me. See, God says you got to come up. Right? 
Because what happened after God said what he said to the serpent, he said what he said to the woman, he said what he said to the man. Now we have a whole bunch of different purposes. We, now it's just complicated. Now it's just complicated. But God created an answer to the very equation that he's trying to solve. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because he talked to the woman, right? In pain you shall bring forth fruit. And all the women are like. <laughs> he talked to the man. By the sweat of your brow shall the earth serve you. It was sweatless victory with your, with your speech. Now you got to use your arms, your legs, your hands, your toil. The weather's going to be out of control. Now there's going to be natural disaster. See, all this, see, y'all didn't know that tornadoes came from sin. Because see, before, before, before there was sin, the Bible says that the earth was watered through a mist. It didn't even rain from the sky. It was just watered through a mist. The earth was on autopilot. But then sin came, and he said, through sweat, drought, right, famine, right, floods, right, all these things, natural disasters, crime, all this stuff came from sin. Them, 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 <laughs> them underwear on the floor came from sin. And the wife looking at the man, see, I told you you was a sinner. I said it came from sin. I didn't say it was a sin. Somebody said, come up. So God created this equation, this, this complicated equation, this, this Pythagorean theorem. Right, this, 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 this quadratic formula, right, this, all my math teachers are like, yes, yeah, he, he talking about math, yeah. But there was a hypotenuse that he created. He had an ace up his sleeve. Because if he's going to tell us to come up, he's not going to come up. He didn't come up. We can't come up until he first comes down. Oh, come on now. Because he gave himself an answer to the very equation that he created in verse number 15. Did you see it or did you miss it? Did y'all see it in verse 15? Go to, go to 315. Go to 315. Look what it says. He says, I will put what? Enmity. Stay right there. Between what? Thee and the woman. And between what? Thy seed and her seed. Hold up, hold up. There's the answer. There's the hypotenuse right there. His name is Jesus. Oh, here we go. And so I got poetics and rhetoric in my house. I got the giving tree in my house. 621 words right here. 15,525 words right here. But I got another word. I got another book. I got another book. <laughs> That's telling me to come up. Because the third point is we come up when God, Jesus, comes down. See, the first point, the first point is, is the first point <clears throat> is to um, know your role. The second point is for you to come up. And the third point is we can't come up until he comes down. And see, I thank God for all of all the books that are in this book. I thank God for the 66 books that are in this book. I thank God for every, every one of the 783,137 words in this book. I thank God for all the 1,200 pages that are in this book. I thank God for the 653 words per page in this book. But I want to let you know, I don't care how many words are in this book, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God and without him there was nothing made that was made and in him was life and his life was the light of men and the darkness comprehended him not in him was the light of the world his name is Jesus and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth the Bible says here that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and so he when he came down he was able to bring us up. I want to know, is there anybody in this room who's going to be what God has called them to be? Yeah. Somebody say it's complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated, but it's not as complicated as we think. Because what the enemy tried to use as a contradiction, God saw it as a compliment. 
what the, what the enemy tried to do as, as confrontation, God, God used it and said it's going to be in concert. The very death that was prophesied to Adam was the very death that it took to keep man alive. Glory be to God. Bible says, hallelujah, that the day you eat of this fruit, huh, you shall surely die. And the Bible says that Jesus huh, went on Golgotha's hill and he lived a life that we could not live. And he died a death that we were incapable of dying so that we can be huh, who God has called us to be. I want to know is there in that body here? Know your role. Come up. But he got to come down. And so sometimes... The reason why you have so much conflict and calamity and confusion in your house is because you don't know your role. You're not coming up or you're not coming down. See, God knew that we were incapable of doing this in our own volition, in our own accord. So he sent down the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Hallelujah. He sent down the comforter. Yes, he did. In order to put on us the spirit of God and the empowerment to be able to live the life that God has anointed us to live from the very beginning of time. Come on, give God some praise in this house. Woo, come on, come on, come on, come on. Woo. There is another extension. There is an expression of God that's in you. It's in you. It's complicated, but it's not difficult. Get that out your vocabulary. It's not difficult. It's just that there may be some elaborately interconnected parts that need to learn how to work in concert together. How many of you know that when you learn Write this down in the tablet of your heart. Learning requires humility. Learning requires humility. Why? Because when I learn something, we must admit what we do not know or what we are ignorant of. I sense in the spirit realm now, as the leaders come up, I sense in the spirit realm, leaders come up and get ready to pray for, for the people. That there are some people who say, I don't know what I'm going to do with this man. I don't know what I'm going to do with this child. I don't know what I'm going to do with this number on my bank account. Watch this. I heard my wife reading earlier, know your numbers for your health. I don't know what I'm going to do with these numbers in my health. But God says, I'm going to open you up as you continue to walk in purpose, and I'm going to ordain and anoint a partner to get you where you need to be.